work as a particle physicist at CERN, and I'm often asked, why is the discovery of the Higgs boson useful? What can I do with the Higgs boson? How can the Higgs boson make my life better? People expect science to be useful, when in fact the majority of the research that we do at CERN is aimed at studying fundamental science. We aim to enrich our understanding of the universe for the sake of understanding our universe. Just as someone may create a painting to be viewed and appreciated, not to be useful, when you see a beautiful painting, you don't ask what it's useful for. In fact, many people consider uh, the distinction between art and everyday objects to be what they think of as its very uselessness. Like art, science can be useful because it expands the horizons of our minds, of our imaginations, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. My job as a scientist is to make sense of the universe, and I think that in a way it's the same for artists. In fact, before the Renaissance, science and art were not considered to be such distinct realms. Science was called natural philosophy, and philosophers pondered both art and science in their attempts to understand the world around them. For instance, Leonardo da Vinci was not only a painter and sculptor, he was also a musician, a mathematician, an inventor, an engineer, a botanist, a geologist, a cartographer, an anatomist, as well as a writer. He was truly the quintessential Renaissance man. Artists and scientists may be more similar than you think. Both aim to engage with and react to their environments in order to better understand them. Both aim to describe nature in the abstract, whether it is with colors, numbers, or with music. Both aim to reveal hidden patterns or relationships in things. And believe it or not, scientists, like artists, seek out beauty, simplicity, and symmetry. Like art, science requires observation, talent, as well as creativity. When we think of the world's greatest scientists, they were those who envisioned their environments in an innovative way. When a scientist creates or validates a successful theory, it can make us think of the world in a new light, just as a work of art may. Einstein's theory of relativity was revolutionary in changing our view of everyday things, such as light, space, time, and gravity. Of course, there are important distinctions between art and science. Art is subjective, emotional, while science, in its attempt to explain the natural phenomena in our world, is expected to be objective, rational, logical, uh, systematic, unbiased. And in addition, the ultimate test of a good scientific theory is whether it is experimentally verifiable. While Einstein's theory of relativity involved creativity and deep insight, its true beauty lies in the fact that it is also experimentally verifiable. But let's return to the similarities between art and science. Both can capture our imaginations as well as evoke emotions, whether it is happiness or anger or frustration that we just don't understand, nonetheless, all of these emotions are valid ones. Often, when we go to a museum or concert, we feel compelled to read more about the works to better understand them, when in fact, many works of art can be appreciated for the very emotions that they evoke. Some works of art may be easier, more straightforward to understand, while others may be more difficult while others may be even more difficult to understand. <laughs> Naturally, we can expand our appreciation of art and science by learning more about them. For instance, when I show you this image of this elderly woman, perhaps your initial feelings are those of curiosity. Who is she? Where is she from? And why is she wearing these big green shoes? Then when I tell you that this elderly woman, she grew up poor, and as a child, she was very embarrassed of her poor shoes, and that her son, an artist, created these big, beautiful green shoes for her because of that, and that she wears them proudly, perhaps that instills a deeper significance in this photograph for you. Well, for me, the fact that this woman is my grandmother, that instills an even deeper significance in this photograph for me. And it can be the same for science. When I tell people about my work as a particle physicist, their reaction is often, wow, that's really amazing. That's so interesting, so exciting, but I certainly don't understand anything about it. <laughs> the reaction I get is often a mixture of excitement and curiosity, but also a bit of embarrassment. 
What I'd like you to understand is that we can appreciate science in the same way that we appreciate art. We don't need to be afraid of science because it's filled with mysterious mathematical formula and also strange looking machinery like this one. We can appreciate science for the very emotions that it, it evokes, whether it's excitement or curiosity or even frustration. Of course, we can expand our appreciation for science by learning more about it. For instance, we can expand our appreciation for the Higgs boson by learning that this elusive particle has captured the imagination of particle physicists for many decades. We can further appreciate the fact that these three men won the Nobel Prize for their theory of electroweak interactions, a crucial component of which is the Higgs mechanism. And we could further appreciate the sheer fact that thousands of scientists, like myself, have spent many, many years designing, building, commissioning, and operating the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider to find this elusive Higgs boson. So, okay, we're excited, we get it, but what is this Higgs mechanism and why is it beautiful? The Higgs mechanism aims to address the simple question, why do elementary particles have mass? All objects have mass, and that mass corresponds to how much they resist to being moved. For instance, I have mass, and the fact that it takes energy or effort for me to move from one place to another, that corresponds to how much mass I have. And it's the same for the elementary particles. The most elementary fundamental particles which make up nature, the electrons, the quarks, etc., they also have mass. And we physicists would like to understand why they have mass. Of course, we can just say that they just do. They just have mass and that's a fact of nature, but we physicists don't find that answer satisfying. We don't find that beautiful. However, many years ago, Peter Higgs here and others found an idea which we did find satisfying and beautiful. In the 1960s, an elegant set of equations were, was devised which explained the interactions between elementary particles. These equations were largely motivated by arguments of symmetry. However, the symmetry of these equations would be ruined if the particles had masses. Peter Higgs and others came up with an idea which allowed us to maintain the symmetry of these equations while imparting mass to these particles. This set of equations, which includes the Higgs mechanism, is called the standard model of particle physics. It is so elegant, so simple, that it could fit on a coffee mug or a t-shirt, for instance. And yet, despite its simplicity, this set of equations has been able to explain the data we, that we observe to incredible accuracy. The one thing that has not yet been confirmed in the standard model is the Higgs boson. The Higgs is the last missing piece of the standard model, the last piece which hasn't been yet experimentally verified. So, you might be wondering, how does the Higgs mechanism work? How does it give mass to the other particles? You can imagine that all of space is filled with an invisible substance. You can think of it as like a sticky molasses filling all of space. And when an elementary particle, like an electron, tries to travel through that sticky substance, the resistance that it feels traveling through this molasses corresponds to its mass. Different particles feel varying degrees of stickiness to this molasses, which is why different particles have different masses. For instance, the top quark, here is much more massive than, say, an electron because it feels much more resistance when it travels through this sticky molasses. This invisible substance, this field filling all of space, is what we call the Higgs field. And the vibrations of this field, or what we physicists call the quanta of this field, are the Higgs bosons. Now, this completely changes our view of empty space. The Higgs field permeates all of space. And no matter how much we try to evacuate a space, even in a vacuum, the Higgs field persists. It is always there. Of course, this is just an idea, a hypothesis, until we find experimental evidence for the Higgs boson. And this brings me back to my work at the Large Hadron Collider. At the collider, we collide protons at very high energies, and the energy of those collisions is converted into mass according to Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. That is, at the Large Hadron Collider, we convert energy into exotic forms of matter, such as the Higgs boson. However, the Higgs boson is a very unstable particle and it likes to decay into other particles. So what we do is we look at the byproducts of these decays to try to reconstruct what produced them. 
For instance, this image you see here is an example of a possible Higgs boson event in the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. Here, the Higgs boson decays into two highly energetic photons. These are the kind of traces that we see in our detector, which enabled us to reconstruct what possibly happened, giving us evidence for the Higgs boson. So, okay, we have evidence for the Higgs boson, so what's next? Well, to really be the Higgs boson, it must exhibit certain characteristics, characteristics which are fundamental to the way that it imparts mass to the other particles. So in order to confirm that what we've seen is the Higgs, we have to measure these characteristics. You may have noticed that the articles we've published suggest that what we've seen is the Higgs, but it's not yet conclusive. As good scientists, we continue to ask questions. We continue to wonder whether, whether there may be physics beyond the Higgs boson, physics beyond our imaginations. I'd like to conclude with an anecdote about American physicist Robert Wilson. In 1969, he was called by Congress to justify the multi-billion dollar machine which is being built outside of Chicago, something like an American equivalent of the Large Hadron Collider. And in his response, Wilson emphasized that it had nothing to do with national security. He said, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture, it has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? I mean, all the things we really venerate are in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to make it worth defending. Certainly, I may not have taught to you all of the fundamentals of particle physics today, but I hope that I've expressed to you the excitement of what's going on at CERN and instilled in you an appreciation for the mysteries that we're trying to uncover at the Large Hadron Collider. And the next time that someone asks you what the Higgs boson is useful for, you can tell them that it's useful for empowering the limitless mind. <laughs>